Business Morning is sponsored in part by the financial professionals at Payne Weber Incorporated and by BMW, the ultimate driving machine. To arrange a thorough test drive, simply phone your nearest BMW dealer. This is Business Morning with Stuart Barney, August 29th, 1986. Hello everyone and welcome to Business Morning. Frontier Airlines has filed for bankruptcy. The carrier in business for over 40 years looks most unlikely to fly again. Its parent, People Express, may be subject to claims from Frontier's creditors. And People's Chairman, Donald Burr, blames the unresponsive and inflexible pilots union for blocking the sale of Frontier to United Airlines. The Commerce Department is investigating what appears to be leaks of economic reports prior to official publication. It is alleged that many people in the financial markets knew in advance the 0.6% second quarter GNP figure. And today there is a lot of speculation that the trade figures will show a $16 billion deficit. Advance information can be valuable to financial traders. The price of platinum moved sharply higher again today, reaching $630 an ounce at one stage before settling back to a price now of around $623. This time last month, platinum sold for well under $500 an ounce. Now let's take a look at the action on the London markets this morning. The gold fix coming in today at $386 even. That's a loss of 30 cents over yesterday's New York close. As for silver, it is up 4 cents. The current quote from London, $5.19 an ounce. The dollar is mixed in London this morning. It is down against the pound sterling. A dollar forty-seven seventy-five is the quote there. The dollar is also lower against the West German mark at 2.05. However, the dollar is up against the yen. 155.80 is the latest London quote. Bond prices higher this morning. Overnight in Tokyo, there was a big purchase of the 10-year Treasury issue. That pushed its yield down to 6.97%. The buying in that maturity spilled over to the 30-year bond and took prices higher there as well. Here is the latest price we have on the long bond from London. Par and a quarter, 108.30 seconds, the yield at 7.23%. At the New York close, the long bond was priced to yield 7.26, so prices up. Yields down so far this morning. Meanwhile, the nation's basic money supply chalked up another big weekly increase, according to the Federal Reserve. For the week ended August 18th, M1, that's the basic money supply measure, it rose $3.1 billion, putting it some $30 billion above the Fed's upper end of its target of 3 to 8% growth in 1986. Joining a chorus of prominent economists, Salomon Brothers' Henry Kaufman called yesterday for the Federal Reserve to keep on easing monetary conditions. Kaufman, sounding even gloomier than usual, warned that though such a policy could rekindle inflation, the alternative, deflation, is a more immediate threat. Kaufman also fretted about the enormous U.S. debt burden, which he says has grown almost 12% so far this decade, compared with just an 8% rise in GNP for that period. Joining me now, Business Morning's Fed Watcher, David Jones. David is Chief Economist at Aubrey G. Lansden Company. Good morning, David. Good morning, Stuart. Can't get away from that buzzword, deflation. Are we in a deflationary spiral? Stuart, we're coming to the end of a process of deflating prices. Remember, the 70s were inflation, the 80s have been deflation, but it's important to note, Stuart, that it's only been in some sectors, mainly the sectors that were inflating in the 70s or deflating in the 80s, energy, farming, mining, other sectors involved in resources, uh, that's not unusual. If we were going to bring inflation down, we had to deflate those sectors. You have to remember that there's another so-called economy here, the service sector, potentially auto sales with those new GM rebates, generally consumer spending on durables and in housing is going to be anything but in a deflation between now and the end of the year. You have no concern whatsoever. This is not a factor in your thinking at all. This has actually been a much more orderly process of deflating the economy after an excessive inflation. Uh, there has been no major bankruptcy that has spilled over into other uh, sectors. There's been no runaway uh, type series of bank failures. Most everything has been a process that's been manageable. It's true we've lost some banks that made too many loans in the energy sector, but the process so far has been quite orderly and I'm not ready to spread panic over the issue this morning. I'm glad to hear that, David. Money supply, way up. It can't all be technical, can it? You're absolutely right, Stuart, and that's part of the argument I'm making. We've had 
almost a year and a half, actually longer than that, of extremely high monetary growth. It's true we needed a good, strong base of monetary growth. It's not all technical. The Fed is literally flooding the banking system and the economy with liquidity. Uh, that's already beginning to show up, by the way, Stuart, in commodity futures prices, which are up, precious metals prices, which are up, and of course we have oil prices that are up. That's setting a bit different base for the markets as we look ahead to the end of the year and next year. You think we're at the turn right now and we should soon begin to see some, uh, some implication that the economy is about to turn up. Yeah, right? and we've seen some, Stuart. I've got evidence. I came armed show with me, evidence this me. morning, Stuart. I knew you would be skeptical. 1.1% uh, leading indicators. To be sure, they were revised down for the month before, but the strengthening is there. Uh, generally speaking, it looks as though the economy, after having a tough first half of this year, is, has bottomed out and we'll see a little bit faster growth. Not a lot, but maybe 2.5% real growth in the third quarter versus that 0.6% subpar growth in the second quarter of 1986. I take it then that you will hold to your opinion that the long bond yield will not go below 7%. That's where we are, Stuart. You always pin me down, but I'll stick with my guns on that. And so far, I've been right, Stuart. Mr. Jones, good luck. Thanks for joining us, David. Thank you, Stuart. We'll be back with more news on Business Morning in one minute. Now back to our lead story. Frontier Airlines filed for bankruptcy protection late yesterday, and as Mike Feierberg reports, despite continued interest on the part of one investor, there are doubts the carrier will ever fly again. Frontier's assets, everything of value the company owns, now is under the control of federal bankruptcy court. Employees who were furloughed Sunday are now officially unemployed. Though Frontier asked the court to order its bank to honor payroll checks issued last Friday, some who didn't cash them right away are finding banks won't take them now. Frontier's parent company, People Express, refused to pour more money into the operation, which has lost $50 million or more this year alone. People Express has had huge losses, too. That's why Frontier was for sale. Could a sale still go forward? Frontier bankruptcy lawyer Hardin Holmes says it could. Chapter 11 is very flexible, so I think you should assume that almost anything is possible. At the same time, I'm not aware of any pending proposals or negotiations. Frontier lawyers say a sale would probably not cover all the company's debt anyway. Frontier owes, among others, more than $1.5 million to AT&T, more than $1 million to Denver Stapleton Airport, and nearly half a million dollars to its food supplier, Sky Chef. And most of Frontier's most lucrative assets have already been sold. But a New Orleans broker is trying to raise $150 million to save Frontier and its people and get the planes flying again. Ellis Houghton told me by phone he thinks bankruptcy will make it an easier and cheaper buy. It may be better to deal with it in the bankruptcy court because then uh, the creditors will be at a point where of, of saying that, well, maybe we better take a little uh, rather than nothing at all, which could ultimately be the case. As for passengers still holding Frontier tickets, you're better off using them for standby seats on other airlines than trying to get a refund. Passengers are near the bottom of the priority list in bankruptcy, and chances of ever seeing money back are very slight. Mike Fearberg for CNN, Denver. A showdown in computers may be coming. The Wall Street Journal reports that digital equipment, which has captured a growing share of the business computer market, is now concentrating on the personal computer customer. Next week, digital is expected to introduce a new PC clone that's compatible with IBM and connects with its own network of VAX computers. IBM is not sitting idly by. It is expected to unveil, perhaps as early as Tuesday, a PC clone combatter. Sources say that machine would be aimed at keeping the clone intruders out of IBM's big corporate accounts. And news among other computer makers, Detroit-based Burroughs is putting a division of its newly acquired Sperry Corporation on the auction block. Burroughs announced yesterday it wants to unload Sperry's Aerospace and Marine Group, a $700 million operation that makes guidance systems. Those cut-rate financing rates are welcome news for car buyers, but as Deborah Marchini reports, there are unwelcome side effects for the nation's banks. Cut-rate auto loans are designed to sell cars, but those low rates have had a side effect. As more buyers get their financing from Detroit's Big Three, that spells trouble for the nation's banks. If somebody's offering a 5, 6, 7 percent rate, we just simply can't compete on it and are not trying to. Because of the incentives, the so-called captive finance companies owned by the big three have been gaining a fatter share of the lending market, that growth coming mostly at the expense of the local bank. Car loans are extremely important to a consumer bank because they uh, make up a substantial portion of their investable, loanable assets. 
Consumer bankers have asked state attorneys general to examine the fairness of the automaker's programs. Some other lenders are taking a more aggressive approach. We found that the market share, the automobile loan market share of credit unions was declining, primarily due to uh, the manufacturer's captive financing, GMAC, Ford Motor Credit, Chrysler Credit. The Texas Credit Union League decided to fight back. Through an agreement with a broker called NCAR, league members now sell automobiles at near wholesale prices to customers like John Pollage. I feel that I saved uh, conservatively, conservatively $1,000 uh, through the credit union. The catch? Buyers must finance the cars through their credit union. We've been averaging probably two to three automobile loans a week. Uh, since July 1, we're doing two or three a day. Now. The league says it's moving 200 cars a month, and that's caught the eye of the industry's national trade group. It's now testing a similar program. If we have the same experience as we see uh, taking place in Texas with Texas credit unions. I don't think there's any doubt the program will go national in a matter of several months. The competition from credit unions shouldn't hurt Detroit's big three. They'll still book a profit on each car sold. It's car dealers who will really feel the pinch as they forego some of their profits on credit union sales. But they're optimistic, a spokesman for the National Automobile Dealers Association, saying they hope to make it up on volume. Deborah Marchini, CNN, New York. And now, our list of banks that pay the best rates on certificates of deposit. According to the 100 highest yields group in North Palm Beach, Florida, the best rate on a six-month CD can be found at Village Savings in Houston, Texas, and the rate there is 7.35%. One-year certificates at Meridian Savings in Arlington, Texas, that has the highest rate at 7.80%. And the best rates on a two-and-a-half-year deposit, that's found at Western Gulf Savings and Loan, 8% even is your rate, while Nevada posts the highest five-year CDs, uh, CD rates, that is, 825, and that's at Frontier Savings in Las Vegas. As usual, we would like to remind you that these are rates, not yields. Your yield depends on how your bank compounds your interest. Now let's go to Reed Collins in our Washington Bureau for the latest headlines. Good morning, Reed. Good morning, Stuart. The convicted spy, Jerry Whitworth, has a long time to sit and think about the damage done to his country. The spy came out of the cold and was plopped into the freezer when he was sentenced yesterday to 365 years in prison. He would be 107 years old before eligible for parole. He was convicted of a dozen counts of espionage and tax evasion for selling the Soviets what the prosecutors term the blueprint of our most coveted and guarded secrets. There was a daring escape from East Germany, one that reads like an adventure novel, at least the last page of one. The midnight silence of Checkpoint Charlie was shattered by the roar of a speeding dump truck. Rifle fire punctuated the night as the truck careened toward, then through the border's crossing point. Safely on the free side of the wall, the unidentified male driver emerged, along with a woman and her daughter who'd been huddling on the floor. The free world had three new inhabitants and seven and a half tons of gravel loaded in that truck. Well, the Pentagon says technical problems have prevented the cruise conversion of a V-52 bomber until at least the end of the year. Now, this means the United States would remain in compliance with the SALT II Treaty, at least in time for the planned Reagan-Gorbachev summit later in the year. Adapting this particular B-52 to the cruise missile system will exceed the SALT II limit on multiple warheads when it takes place. The Goodyear blimp is taking a week off from floating over athletic events to help the U.S. Customs Service spot smugglers along the Texas Gulf Coast. Los Angeles Times reports this morning Goodyear will absorb the cost of this week-long test. The government wants to deploy radar-equipped blimps along the Mexican border, but private contractors have told the government the testing of that system would cost twice what the uh, appropriations for the project would allow. That's it from here, Stuart. Thank you, Reed. Rumors in the stock and bond markets Wednesday that the Commerce Department would report a strong rise in its July index of leading indicators proved to be suspiciously on target. And that's prompted the department to reassess its internal security controls. Meanwhile, yesterday, word on the street was that this morning's Commerce Department report would show a massive $16.1 billion trade deficit for the month of July. And predictions of that near record shortfall sent bond prices up sharply Thursday. 
One more time, we'll check back on the London markets for you. Let's start with the price of gold. The current quote, $387 even. That shows a gain of 70 cents over the New York close. Silver at 519, up 4 cents. The dollar mixed in moderate trading. Sterling at $1.47. The dollar at 2.05, West German marks. And the dollar is higher against the yen. 155.80 is our quote. Platinum, which last year was at just $340 an ounce, is now trading at nearly twice that amount, 626. That is the current London quote. Todd Benjamin reports on the precious metals' meteoric rise. Traders at the New York Mercantile Exchange pushed the price of platinum to its highest level since 1980. The active October contract closing at $614.60 an ounce. Contracts for later delivery also hitting new highs. Attempts over the past week to push the strategic metal through $600 failed. But Thursday, two factors pushed it beyond. Number one, a very large speculative buyer came into the market in Europe, took a fantastic quantity of metal, and uh, got the market moving upwards. At the same time, there was news of uh, renewed violence in South Africa, creating general anxiety amongst investors, speculators, and industrial users. Together, uh, those factors fueled this uh, tremendous uh, short covering and wave of new buying. South Africa produces about 80% of the Western world's platinum, and there is concern over possible supply disruptions. The biggest use of platinum is for catalytic converters, devices used to control auto pollution. But platinum is also used in jewelry and has electrical applications. Good industrial and strong investor demand amid fairly tight supplies have been pushing platinum prices higher this year. Now that it's broken through the psychological $600 mark, some analysts say the price could reach $650, $675 over the next month. But caution, there could be some profit taking along the way. I think we can expect the market probably to take a breather. It's been moving fast. Platinum is now trading more than $150 above its levels a month ago. Todd Benjamin, CNN, New York. The oil markets have been very quiet this week, and it's the same story again today. No change in the price of oil on the London energy market as of right now. The price for a barrel of Brent North Sea crude September delivery, 1440. That's where it closed yesterday in Houston. A barrel of West Texas Intermediate closed in New York yesterday, up just two cents at 1581. That is for the October delivery. Now, back to Business Morning with Stuart Varney. After falling 13 points in early trading yesterday, the Dow Jones Industrial Average managed to rebound a little by the close. It showed a loss of 4.36 at the closing bell, almost right at 1900. The Transportation Index down 3.75, utilities down 0.28. Volume moderate at 125 million shares. The S&P 500 also losing ground, off 0.46 on the day. Same story with the New York Composite, it was down 0.17. The Wilshire 5000 index showed a $2 billion loss for the value of all listed stocks. Investing in foreign markets has been a very lucrative business recently. My guest this morning heads up a global fund that invests in securities markets at home and abroad. He is Robert Prindeville, president of Thomson McKinnon Asset Management. Robert, welcome to the program. Good morning, Stuart. Now, international funds, global funds, they do well when the dollar falls and when foreign markets go up. I put it to you that both of those trends may have just about run their course. We don't think so. We think that there are four primary reasons why these markets will continue. First, liquidity is greater today than it has ever been in the past. There is more money available not only in the U.S. but in foreign markets to go into common stock prices as well as bonds. Mm -hmm. Secondly, capitalism is back in vogue. Uh, not only in the European markets but in the Pacific Basin as well. Thirdly, oil prices. Oil prices at $15 a barrel have strong implications for the European uh, economies as well as the Japanese economy. The, they are enormous consumers of oil, and oil at $15 leaves a lot of money available to go into consumer goods and that type of investment dollar uh, versus $30 oil. And lastly, the G5 agreement has shown us that Governments around the world can work together to bring down interest rates. You know, the Japanese market has gained, what, 30-odd percent and more just so far this year. Can you really expect that much further of a run-up after all of those gains? We think so. 
we think that the Japanese market is becoming a consumer-oriented market. It has not been that in the past. Uh, the Japanese people have, are looking to invest uh, their dollars in consumer goods, home building stocks, that type of thing. These stocks, we think, are going to be attractive. Would you touch the Australian or Canadian markets? Because the dollar has not yet fallen against their currencies. There could be a currency play there, could there? That is true. However, those are natural resource-oriented economies. And we just think at this point that there is not the attraction that there is in places like Japan, uh, Germany, France. I've looked at my lipper, and I know that eight of the top ten performing mutual funds are foreign funds, and a lot of them have done better than 60% returns so far this year. Don't tell me you can match that. <laughs> I don't think that we will...